Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the November installment of our Senior Health uh, COVID Town Hall. We're very excited to have you all here, and we've got a great um, uh, lineup of speakers who have some very uh, interesting things to say. Uh, and with, I'd also like to welcome our folks uh, visiting from the OSHA Lifelong Learning Institute at UMass Boston and the Boston University Geriatrics Program. Uh, so welcome everyone. I hope you enjoy this. And without further ado, I should probably introduce myself just in case, right? <laughs> I didn't do that. Well, my name is Matt Russell. I'm the medical director of senior health and also the uh, clinical director of geriatrics at the Massachusetts General Hospital. Now, without further ado, uh, I'll pass it on to uh, Susan Edgman Levitan, who will help moderate this. Thank you, Dr. Russell. Um, and I just want to add my welcome to everybody. Um, we love that we're expanding our community of people that join us for these town halls, especially as we move into colder weather. And it's just great to be together with everyone. So a few housekeeping rules before we get started. Um, first of all, everyone will notice that you're muted. And we do that to eliminate any background noise. Um, so, <clears throat> as you're looking at the screen, you can view the speaker on your full screen, or you can go to the gallery view in the upper right corner. You'll see a little box that looks like a little tic-tac-toe um, board, and if you click on that, you'll see all of everyone on the Zoom, or if you just want to see the speaker, you click on speaker view. If your picture becomes jumpy or out of sync, or you start having difficulty hearing the speaker, click the stop video icon in the lower left-hand corner because that will speed up your connection um, and will help everything stay more, stay more stable. Um, for questions, and we have time at the end of the presentations for people to ask questions, please use the chat feature and if you look at, at the bottom ribbon across the screen, you'll see chat right in the middle. Um, but we also just want to make sure that you know that anything you write, everyone can see. And because we can see all of you, we really um, want to make sure that you know not to ask any personal medical questions. We don't want to look at any rashes or anything that you may need advice about. But if you do have a medical question, please get in touch with your physician um, to find out if there's anything else that you should be doing. We're covering a lot of information. And so we wanna make sure that we get to all your questions and get to everything else. So with that, I'm now going to introduce our speakers. So you've already heard from Dr. Russell, who is the clinical director of the geriatrics. Susan, I'm Susan, Depart Susan yes? I'm yes? so sorry to interrupt. Someone in the chat has already asked if you could repeat how they make it less jumpy. And oh, let's go okay. On. Sorry. Thank, thank you. Um, to make your, your video less jumpy, go down to the bottom left corner of your screen and you'll see a little video camera. Click on that and when a red line goes through it, you've stopped your video and that should help speed up your internet connection. <clears throat> so thank you, Judy. Um, so just to finish introducing Dr. Russell, he's also the medical director of senior health. Um, I'm, I'm Susan Edgman Levitan and I'm the director of the Stokel Center for Primary Care Innovation at Mass General. Um, we're also going to be hearing today from Dr. Sari Sanchez, who is an infectious disease physician, and she's a Commonwealth Fund Fellow in Minority Health Policy at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. And then we're going to um, have a fun event with Mr. Phil Golden, who is an American Council on Exercise Certified Personal and Group Exercise Trainer, who's going to lead us through some chair exercises that I'm looking forward to. And then we're going to hear from Dr. Sharon Levine and Dr. Russell again. And Dr. Levine is the head of geriatric medicine at Mass General. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Sanchez. 
Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, it is, it, I'm very excited to be here and to talk to you all. Um, and um, I'd first like to start off by saying that these are very hard times, I think, for all of us and for our nation, for the world. Um, you know, I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about um, guidance for the upcoming winter and the holidays for COVID-19 based on what we've learned thus far. And then we can talk a little bit about updates in the setting of testing resources and, and vaccines um, that there have been a lot, of, a lot in the news over the past week about. So I think one of the, one of the things I'd, I'd like to do today is just, you know, basically take a step back and think about what lies ahead in terms of the winter. What we've learned about this virus um, and what we've seen over the past, you know, nine months, um, and based on all the investigations that have come out, is that usually a lot of people, uh, transmission can occur in indoor settings. Um, this virus, I'll remind everyone, is transmitted by droplets, um, you know, or small particles that people can cough or sneeze or when they talk are produced and can land on the mouths or noses um, of other people or can be inhaled. Um, usually in outdoor settings, um, this is usually less likely to, to occur because there's a lot of good ventilation and air. And that's a little bit of why it's been, it's been tricky now that as we move towards the winter and the climate gets colder. And oh, this is reflected in some of the trends that we're seeing, um, especially in Massachusetts and in a lot of other states in, in the country. We're seeing rising rates of community transmission of COVID. And so what does this mean for you in terms of how you plan your winter? So I think in other sessions, so first of all, I think that we all really need to be very cautious about who is around us and where, where we go and the places that we choose to be. Um, we've talked a little bit before about the concept of bubbles, meaning people that you live with and that you don't necessarily social or and or that you don't necessarily social distance from, meaning people that you don't wear a mask from or that you, you choose to be in close contact with. Um, we've talked, as I said before, about how you can create these groups, um, you know, small bubbles of, of people. But I think that what becomes harder now and why we need to sort of re-ask a lot of questions is that as the community transmission rises and we know that there's a lot of virus going around in the community, I really urge everyone to be particularly cautious over the next months and to, and to re-engage in some conversations, um, meaning that, if you're seeing people that you don't live with, you really need to ask a little bit more about, you know, where, who else are they, who else people are seeing? What are the daily activities that they're, you know, what are the daily activities? A lot of people say that they're isolating, but that can have different meanings to people. And so I think that I encourage, I encourage a lot of you to, to ask, ask these questions, um, especially as we approach the holidays. With Thanksgiving next week, um, it's very tricky because Thanksgiving is sort of the epitome almost of what we shouldn't do with COVID, right? A lot of us enjoy long Thanksgiving dinners with big family, spending all that time together in a warm environment. And, you know, that is the kind of environment that right now, a lot of us in my community and my professional community are, encourage, are encouraging you to think twice about. Um, you know, right now, the recommendation from a lot of my colleagues and from myself is that the easiest thing and the safest thing to do this Thanksgiving it, is to eat dinner with everyone else that you would otherwise be eating on a daily day, meaning people from your home. Um, and, and I think the reasoning behind that is it really is the same. Basically, it, it really wouldn't differ from the, the dinners that you have on a daily basis um, and to really keep it uh, to your very close bubble, the people that you live with. Now, we recognize that not everyone might be able to adhere to that advice, or that advice might not be what you necessarily think is best for yourself or want to do. Um, and this is very hard. Um, I think everyone's circumstances are very different. And so in addition to that, I'd like to talk a little bit about what else you can do to minimize your risk. And I like to think of this a little bit. This is going to sound like an interesting, um, almost a funny name, but there's a, a model coming out amongst, amongst ID doctors called the Swiss cheese model. Um, if you think about a slice of Swiss cheese, you have different holes, and if you have just one slice, you can have anything, a fly, a small mosquito, come in through any hole. And if you think about the virus, if you just have one slice, it's very easy for the virus to get from one side to the other. But if you layer slice upon slice, 
and really use different layers of protection, you really reduce your risk of contracting COVID. And so when we think about the model and what that means for all of you, it's that the safest thing is to really keep your bubble very, very small or only see the people that you live with. Um, but if that's not feasible, then adding on those extra layers are very important. And so when we think about Thanksgiving, what can this Thanksgiving look like if it doesn't necessarily look like dinner at home? A few things. One of them is, you know, you can keep the gathering small. I think that with rising rates of community transmission, every person in, even if they test negative, is a risk of transmission for everyone in the house. And so the, the smaller numbers of people, the better. Um, two, if, you know, eating outside is what some other experts have gathered, that's really hard for us in Massachusetts. And same is, you know, keeping the windows open, that's tough. Um, but others are staying distance if you're indoors, wearing a mask when you're not eating. Um, you know, these, these measures seem small, but they can go a long way. Um, and so, you know, keeping the eating and drinking time relatively short um, is another measure. Um, and then in the week before, I think if you're really going to see people outside of your home, as I said, I would really talk to them and make sure that they are isolating, staying home, really limiting their contact with other people. Um, a question that I get asked often is about testing. You know, I really encourage you um, to think about testing in a different way for the winter. Um, now that we have more testing resources available, people are able to get tested. But I think that the negative result, which is what we like to focus on, is not as sometimes, is something that I want to reframe a little bit. If someone has a negative test result, um, it doesn't really mean as much if you don't know what they did in the past week before that test or even in the past two weeks before that test, since we know that people can incubate the virus up to two weeks. However, if someone has a positive test, um, it can really, it can actually be a critical measure to prevent them from seeing others and spreading the virus. The reason I mention this is because, you know, if you are going to have others around you over the past, you know, months, uh, over the next upcoming months, or if you're gathering for Thanksgiving, a common thing that's being put out there is to get tested before Thanksgiving. And I, 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 I say that that's an important measure, but I think it's an important measure alongside with the behaviors, with isolating the weeks before. But the important thing about being tested is not so much the negative result. It's that if you are going to gather, I would encourage people to get tested because if they're positive, it can keep you from hosting them in your home and having a super spreader event. And so I would really reframe it a little bit in that way. I think that people, we, we should all really get tested and sort of take advantage of the resources, but I'd like to frame the conversation a little bit differently. And I'd empower you all, in addition to the conversations that you have about people in your bubble isolating and staying home, encourage that if you are going to see others and if it makes you feel more comfortable to have them get tested, but really only to think about it if they're positive that you're not going to see them and that you could avert a crisis rather than the other way around. Um, and so the, and other than that, the CDC today actually came out with guidance urging Americans not to travel for Thanksgiving. Um, you know, I think that's, that's something that's been pretty, um, that's fresh off the table and I think is it consistent with what, what a lot of us in my field are recommending, which is that we really have to stick to our own homes and bubbles to make this the safe, a safe Thanksgiving. Um, in addition to sort of some of the other Swiss, other layers in the Swiss cheese model that we can implement, um, that's what I would encourage you to do. Um, in sort of, so that's, I think, a little bit about the holidays. Um, it, it's really hard. We're all tired and we all we need to take care of ourselves mentally, emotionally, and physically. But these are, I think, some of the things that I would, I would encourage and urge upon all of you to keep yourself safe. Um, in addition to that, a brief update on the vaccine landscape. So two companies, Moderna and Pfizer this week, um, came out um, with news that their vaccines are, not, or at least that they report that their vaccines are 94 and 95% effective, uh, respectively. Um, this is really exciting and I think, you know, a beacon of hope for us, knowing that if this Thanksgiving or these holidays were not able to be, you know, to celebrate in the ways that we'd like, that there is hope for the future. Um, I think a, a lot of questions have been raised around the timeline and just the, the distribution of this. And I'd just like to briefly mention what we know so far. Um, first of all, the 
Efficacy rates that they mentioned, 94%, 95%, those are, these are all from press releases, meaning that the companies have not revealed their own data yet. From what they've told us, we do know that they included um, patients 65 or older, um, and at least Pfizer mentioned that the, the efficacy was similar in that population. So that is very encouraging um, for, our, for our senior population. Um, we know that there are plans in place. Um, currently, the CDC and the National Academy of Medicine are considering a phased approach um, for when the vaccine is made available and how to distribute it. And I just want to reassure you that even though we know we, we don't know everything, there do seem to be very thoughtful approaches to priority populations, including elderly adults and essential workers and medical workers, as well as um, equitable, you know, the having a lens of equity in mind with the distribution. The timeline and what everything looks like is still not, is still yet to be determined. And, you know, there are sort of some, some factors that limit the ability to get this out immediately. And so I, I would say that this is all very encouraging, but, you know, we still have to, as with the Swiss cheese model approach, we still have to maintain sort of our vigilance when it comes to masking, social distancing, and keep our guard up. And so I'll finish there for now. Um, and I'll look to questions in the chat. And thank you so much. Um, and um, again, stay safe. And now I think we're going to move on to Mr. Golden and our exercise. Great. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Susan. Can you hear me? Yes. Super. Okay. Um, as we've heard before, as we move inside, we're spending more time inside and access to exercise might become a little bit more difficult as we go into the winter and um, various situations. We thought it might be helpful to share with you some exercises that you can do in your home um, that will be safe and effective. Um, they're really exercises that are designed to help you sort of keep your, your muscles and your body and your um, in tune, both flexible and durable. So basically the activities that you do in and out every day, which we call the activities of daily living. So what we'll do today is we'll go through six different exercises that we think will help um, you sort of keep, keep, keep parts of your body toned and ready for your, act your, act um, your activities of daily living. Um, we'll explain what parts of the body that it um, will impact. We'll go through the six and then we'll go through the, and then we'll have a, just a quick review of, um, of them before we go off. So what we want to do first is we want to get ourselves a nice sturdy chair. Um, I kind of think a kitchen chair or an office chair can be really effective. Something that's not um, upholstered uh, and you can get a good sort of um, nice comfortable seat on that chair, okay? Um, so as we go forward with the six exercises that we're doing, we're going to work our way down the body, okay? And what we'll do, uh, we'll, we'll have the six exercises and we're going to do eight repetitions of each. And again, with each of these, our goal is to increase the flexibility and the durability of the muscle and the body systems that we're targeting. Um, also, the goal of these exercises is, is for you to challenge yourself, okay? Um, but not to the point where you might incur or you might experience any pain or discomfort. Um, again, you wanna challenge yourself, um, do the exercises, focus on the quality of the movement, but certainly not to the point where you're at, um, experiencing any pain or discomfort. So to get started, why don't we think about our posture? What we want to be doing for these exercises is we want to be sitting on the chair. We want to have a straight but relaxed spine in the back. We can do that by sort of pushing our shoulders back, keeping our face forward. We keep our um, feet and our knees forward. Um, and we keep our body nice and flexible, okay? So our first exercise, which is gonna focus on the shoulders and the back, is called the goal pose. And you do, well, how you do a goal pose is you lift your hands up in front of you, creating 90 degree <laughs> angles, okay? And it, an easy thing to think about here is you wanna keep your elbows and your shoulders pretty much in the same line, okay? And then what we're gonna do is we're just gonna hold our hands out in front of us and we're just gonna open up where we're really feeling that in the chest and the back and close. And we'll do eight of those. So seven, six, and you wanna focus on the quality of the motion, okay? Four, 
three, two, and one. Great. Okay. And that should, again, open up your, your chest and your shoulders as well. Our next exercise is a torso twist. So again, sitting in our position with our shoulders full, our shoulders back, head facing forward, knees and feet facing forward. What we're gonna do is bring our two hands out in front of us, right at about chest level, spread our elbows apart with our hands up, and we're just going to keep our hips facing forward and turn our shoulders to the left four times. Three and four. All right, and then to the right four times. And you should be getting a nice twist right in here. All right, and the left again for four times. And again, we're focusing on our torso right here. Three. Four and the right for four more. Okay. Two and one more. Great. Okay. Moving down the body, we're going to march in place. Um, again, we go back to our posture with the um, shoulders back, head facing forward, and we're just going to lift our legs up and march in place, nice and uniform. But what we're doing here is we're giving our hips a workout and we're helping with the flexibility. Now, how we're going to increase the eff effectiveness of this workout is we're just gonna march each leg out to the side, very slowly, march out till you feel a little resistance and then back in and out and in and out and in and out and one more time out Great, okay. Um, and again, you can do it just the, your legs right in front of you if that's comfortable, but if you wanna get a little extra um, oomph from it, you can open your legs to one side or both. All right, our next exercise is our knee flex. And what we'll do here is from our um, standard posture position, we're going to bring our right leg um, out in front of us, raise our right foot, bring our right leg out in front of us, and then down. And when you're bringing your leg down, you want to just um, not bring it down hard, but you just want to sort of slide it along the ground. So three, four, and nice, even, slow movements. All right, and now the left leg, bringing that foot up and down, and two, and three, and four, and five, and six. A super. Okay, and now we have our last two, which are foot flexes. And really all this is, is um, uh, what we're gonna do is really just go up on tippy toes. So again, we, we're from our position of our standard posture, we're just gonna raise our heels up and put our weight on the balls of our feet. Okay, so bring it up and then down, and we'll do this eight times, two, Three, and this is giving you um, strengthening your feet, but also giving your ankles some added flexibility. And four, three, 
two, and one. Great. And the final exercise is ankle circles. And what we do here is we just raise our right foot off the ground. And what we're going to do is we're going to circle our ankles in a clockwise motion. for eight turns, and then in a counterclockwise motion, and then lift up our left foot, and in a clockwise motion, and counterclockwise. Great, okay, so before we go, uh, I just wanna go through each of those one more time, just very quickly, not to go through the eight, and just revisit to what, e what each of them is for. The overarching goal here, again, is to create flexibility and durability in the areas of our body that we use most in our daily activities. So again, we started with the goal post, which really opened up our chest, gave us flexibility in our shoulders, and would really help us with reaching and pulling of exercises or um, at, um, tasks. Um, second was a torso twist, where we're moving from side to side, but we're really getting some additional flexibility in our torso and our back. Third was march in place, and that was helpful to give you um, additional flexibility and function in your hips, which can, you know, we're sitting a lot these days and to move your hips when we're, when in, um, in this way is really gonna um, replicate walking um, in a good way. It's a good way to get, give your hips a little bit of exercise when it's not as easy to get up and around. Um, then we have the knee flexes, which we're just bringing our foot out in front of us, flexing that knee, keeping it nice and hydrated with bodily fluids. There you go. The fifth was foot flexes, where we're basically doing tippy toes, bringing those heels up and forcing the, the balls of your feet down. And then the sixth was ankle circles. And this is such a great way to give your ankles some exercise. Ankles are so important to us for mobility, um, but they can often be overlooked in exercise um, regimes. So I, I love the ankle circles because they really do give you um, many, many benefits that, that, um, for, for both mobility and just comfort of walking and getting around. Um, so there we are. I hope those were helpful for you. I'll be here in the question section. Um, and with that, I'll hand it to, back to Sharon. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Sharon and Matt, Sharon, yeah. Matt, you're on mute. I'm thanks, here. Thanks so much, Phil. I don't know about the rest of you, but I've been sitting on my tush all day and that really felt <laughs> good. <laughs> One Zoom meeting after another. Even though I didn't get off my tush, I got to move everything else. Um, it's great to see some old faces here and some new faces and to welcome folks from Boston Medical Center and Osher, and um, it, uh, we're just so happy to have you here. So we wanted to let you know that if you, we are here for you and all of you are, are in practices, even if you're not in the senior health practice, and um, your doctors want to see you if you need to be seen. So um, make sure that you, you check your practices, but I can tell you everything is wiped down, cleaned down, antiseptic. Um, in our clinic, as most clinics, people are put back in the room so that people are not sitting in a waiting room anymore. And, um, and we are all wearing masks and many of us are wearing goggles. And if we need to look in your throat, we can do that by putting on a face shield. Um, and so we, we are totally prepared 
for um, uh, socially distancing in our exam rooms and um, and with the the um, uh, the PPE that we wear ourselves. Um, I do want to stress something that's really important because it, I think many we know that there are many people who don't want to come in when they're feeling sick, and it's really important if you're sick. You know, if you got a little something that can wait, that's fine. But if you're feeling sick. It's really important to call the office, speak with your doc or whoever's covering your doc if your doc is not there. And um, because we wanna see you. And uh, you know, there are many people who have put off coming to the doctor during this time because it seems scary to come. But if you're able to come and you're not feeling well, it's better to do that than to wind up in the emergency room or to you know put off something that can get worse. And, We've all seen, many of us in medicine have seen that. So we're, we're, if you are concerned, and some people are concerned, obviously, we will do virtual visits with you. Um, we can do the video visits, we can do FaceTime visits. Um, and even for some people who don't have access to video Zoom, um, we can do telephone visits. Um, so you shouldn't not, you shouldn't not call, um, even if you don't want to come in. But I want to just stress that it's, fine to come in because we can take care of you and we're prepared to do that. Um, we know, you know, we know that um, we know that you're you're thinking a lot about being with others. And I really appreciate what um, Dr. Sanchez said, you know, we're all feeling the same way. Um, and uh, it's, it's a hard time. It's a hard time for families. We've all been doing this for what seems like forever now, and it has been forever. And I'm doing a Thanksgiving Zoom, you know, I'm going to sit here in my house and talk to the people who I love on and off through the night. And that will be the way that we will connect. It'll, these, are, these are new times. Um, um, you should all check with your own practices for how, um, for, about the things that Dr. Sanchez was talking about. And, um, and I do want to tell you that we are open for business, as most practices are, and we're also here in senior health seeing new consultations. So you can get consultations from your doctor. You can do a self-referral. Um, if you have a, a, pro, a problem that's a, a problem that's related to being an older adult, um, so you can self-refer, but doctors can also refer you. And we um, are, we're open for business. We're seeing lots of, I saw, I saw a mix of people in the office yesterday and people on the phone. And it was great seeing people on the phone and it was really great seeing people in the clinic, even though I, we had to blow air, air kisses. Um, the other thing that I, I really want to stress is that this, even though this is a scary time, and I, I've said this before when, we, when I've talked with you, that there will never be a first time. This is our new surge and we know a lot more than we did. Um, taking care of patients with COVID um, that, you know, than we did in March and April and May last year. We know how to take care of patients that get COVID. And um, that's why it's important to really take this seriously because um, no one wants to be in a position where they can spread it or anything like that. So we know we know how to take care of this. And really what, what Dr. Sanchez says is true. I mean, I'm sitting here, I, I'm like, this is my, I, I'm wedded to my mask. I'm never like more than a foot from my mask. Every time I go out and take out the garbage can, I put it on. And that's the way, you know, that's the way life is now and is gonna be for some time to come. But um, we're finding new ways of connecting. People are playing online bridge and people are taking courses and people are meeting with friends. Um, I know some people who are doing fire pits outside. It's getting a little bit cold for that, but um, there are ways to do these things and be socially distant. So um, we are, you know, we wanna make sure you get your influenza vaccine, Never mind the COVID vaccine, but that'll be here when it'll be here. But the influenza vaccine is gonna be really important for all of you. I got mine, I wouldn't be allowed to work. If I didn't, they would cut me off from civilization at the hospital if I didn't get my, my vaccine. So it's really, really important to, um, to get vaccinated because the combination 
would would be a very you know tough com you know it would be very tough for people to to um people get sick from from the flu in the winter time um that's about all i wanted to say i don't know if um you know we're being very welcoming to people who want to come in for consults or or self referrals and um to make sure that you all just stay safe especially during this really hard time of seat of year that we're coming on i i heard somewhere yesterday somebody said on the news why don't we just like delay all the whole holiday season to next July and see if we can and see if we can get together then and sort of think about it that way. I don't think any of us want to do that, but there are ways that we can be together that are safe, that are and and safe for us and the people we love and the people we don't even know. So um, that's what I would say. And I don't know if Dr. Russell has anything else he wants to add from his position of being uh, the um, medical director of uh, senior health. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Uh, yes, to echo, uh, you know, it's going to be in many ways a very weird winter. I've decided personally I'm going to start reading big Russian novels because <laughs> they know how to do winter correctly over there. <laughs> they give you good long stories and it's time for Anna Karenina to have the dust blown off of it. War and um, peace. War and peace. Yes, exactly. Well, I mean, I, I think I should be done by Anna, with Anna Karenina by May. Um, so I did, for those uh, who are new to the town hall, I did just want to give a little review about what the real reason is that we're doing this. And so the first thing is, with a lot of the 24-hour news cycle and social media, we get a lot of missed in, mi mixed information in terms of... Um, fear factor to truth telling and, and whatnot. So we really wanted this to be an opportunity for folks to hear from the experts about the latest and greatest on COVID. And so that's why we had Dr. Sanchez here today to speak to that. We also wanted to let you know that we're here for you. And the folks at, at, at Boston University Geriatrics are there for you as well. That we are open for business and we want to make sure that you know how it works in this weird time. But lastly, and mo most importantly, we know that the epidemic of isolation and loneliness and life disruption has had really a huge ripple effect on our quality of life. And so it's really important for us to stay in community, both physically, as we did with Phil, where we're, we're exercising, and, and, and thank you, I, my Fitbit actually recorded me as exercising, which was great, um, but also that we're having intellectual stimulation, that we're not just passively staring at the television and, God forbid, watching the 24-hour news cycle unfold. These things aren't healthy for our thinking or our being, so we really want to encourage you in this time of the pandemic <clears throat> to deliberately plan. And what that means is not only around the holidays, but on a random Tuesday in February, what are you going to do physically for yourself to keep fit? What are you going to do intellectually or mentally to keep cognitively intact? We have a lot of resources that we know about, and one of them is seniorplanet.org, which is a sort of a clearinghouse of exercise and, and activities for people. There's also the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at UMass Boston, which has online courses to keep you active. And then we're also, do we did a little pilot here in Senior Health on having a virtual, we call it sort of a virus vent, uh, but a support group for, for, for our patients to basically sit and talk about how we're navigating the challenges. And so today we were talking in our group about what are we going to do to celebrate the holidays safely? And we were trying to strategize around how to do an online chess game between two grandchildren living in two different homes with grandpa as the arbiter. So it's really important to think about, okay, if I get a Zoom account, if I get some sort of Google Duo group going on, how can I stay in touch with my friends and my family because it isn't just about doing crosswords and Sudoku or doing squats and sit-ups. You have to be social. We're social beings and we have to stay in community. So I encourage you to actually write down the answers to these questions every day. What am I doing to keep myself physically active, mentally active, and socially active? 
we have to build our own scaffolding at this point because we're in our little lunar isolation places. But, but really think about what am I doing physically, mentally, and socially to stay healthy. And um, again, just to echo Dr. Levine, um, we are you know, not only seeing our primary care patients and accepting new primary care patients, but we are also doing consultation to help primary care providers around any challenging issues associated with aging. So if you or any of your friends might, might benefit from this, um, we're gonna put the information on the, uh, on the, on, in the chat box. And I think that's all I have. And, and uh, Susan, I'll turn it back to you. All right, um, thank you. Those were all wonderful suggestions. One, one quick suggestion I have that I've been hearing about from some of my friends who have grandchildren are they are scheduling reading sessions where they, every Sunday night, they get on a Zoom with their grandkids and read books. Um, or it doesn't have to be Sunday night, but they, they are having as much fun, I think, if not more than their grandchildren. So just some other ideas about things that you can do to connect with family members. But we've got some people that have very important questions who've been very patient. So Dr. Sanchez, I'm going to direct many of these your direction. Um, mm -hmm. the, and so um, a couple just to get us going. Mm -hmm. Is it okay, is it safe to have contact with people who have had COVID and recovered? And the second one is, it's, someone says, it's my understanding that testing should be done three days before a visit, and then again, one day before. Is this correct? And does your advice for the holidays and family visits extend to immunosuppressed adults? Thank you, Susan. So for the first question, is it safe to have contact with people who have recovered from COVID? Um, I would, what I would say is that if someone was recently infected and they are cleared from quarantine, meaning they can leave their house, I would say that you can interact with them as you would with any other person in the community. Meaning, you know, I would still, you know, I would, they are able to leave their homes and, and they should not be able to transmit the virus, but I would still maintain social distancing. And here's why, um, if you are, if, if there's someone who you're otherwise socially distanced from. I think the important part of this question that I want to emphasize is that we don't yet know how long that immunity lasts. And in fact, we've already seen that people can get reinfected. And so I wouldn't treat someone who's recovered from COVID and, and has immunity as someone that all bets are off, I can remove, you know, I, I can, they're not gonna get infected with COVID now and I can remove my mask. I would say you can interact with them and you know, they've been cleared from quarantine from a, for a reason, but I would still exercise the same precautions that I would with any other person. Um, and that's why um, we're still learning more on that. As to the question with, with the testing, yeah. these are great questions. And so I, I, like to think of, I, I like to think of examples in order to sort of answer these best. And so for the one about you know, the frequency of testing and then should testing be done three days before and then one day before. So again, I think one of the challenges of testing is that we still don't yet know. I mean, there's a lot of variability when it comes to someone who might have been exposed to the virus, you know, at a restaurant or, you know, interacting with other people in an enclosed or tight space. And then when is it that after that, that exposure that we can detect the virus in your nose or in your mouth or in your saliva? And for example, um, and I think that's really the key question and why it's so hard to answer this. So, and I think that's part of why too, I think when, when it comes to negative testing, it's not only just the test, you have to interpret it in terms of what the person has been doing in the weeks before the test, meaning their behaviors. So let's, for example, say that I went to a restaurant last Friday, I have not, um, but let's say that I did, um, and I'm getting tested today, um, you know, because I want to, uh, I'm getting tested today. Um, that I could test negative today, but I could still, I'm still within a period where I could be incubating the virus. And so if I'm getting tested today to see my family members next weekend or sort of in the next few days, I could, I could test negative, but I could still transmit the virus in two days. And that's what we've seen a lot of the studies with the CDC. There was a, a, a children's camp a few months ago it, um, that 
everyone had to test negative before coming to the camp and there were still transmission events for this reason you know i'd say that for that reason two tests are better than none to my there's not i think what you're referring to um 16174 is that some states have implemented some te testing um for example in new york now you have to get tested within 72 hours uh, before travel and then another test within a day or two or before arriving and part of the reasoning for that is that two tests are better than one because if you weren't sort of shedding virus when you got it done three days ago maybe you will be in a day and maybe you will catch that but I, I still encourage people to think more about testing as the positive result averting a crisis, the positive result keeping me home, or in the context of who I'm seeing, if I encourage everyone around me to be tested, I protect myself from seeing that person who may might test positive and that was a complete surprise and I would have been seeing them on Thanksgiving. So that's why I think it's important to reframe that. Um, and I think, again, two tests are better than none, but there's really no right answer. I think it's testing and behaviors. Um, and I think the other question under that, does your advice for the holidays and family visits extend to immunosuppressed adults? I would say if I were an immunosuppressed adult, I, I, I'm trying, you know, I, I, again, I like to think about these in examples in terms of what I would do if it were my grandmother, if it were my mother, right? Um, I, I think I would really, really, the people that are around me, have very open conversations about isolating beforehand. I think that behaviors, meaning if someone, if you're gonna have someone around you, um, I would encourage them to really isolate for two weeks. And by isolate means stay at home, limit seeing other people, and also potentially get tested again because you not, you don't know and that positive result could, could, could avert a visit. But um, I would be very careful and I would ask everyone around me as well and really limit that to small numbers of people um, that I'm seeing. Um, and again, using testing as a tool, but really just encouraging them or, or an asking of them to otherwise stay at home if they're going to be seeing me. I'm going to ask you one other question that came in or two. One is, mm -hmm. um, is there any, S well, hang on, let me just, can you make a comment about a recent study on dog owners and higher COVID-19 rates? And then I think we're gonna ask you the $64,000 question is, do we have any estimates of when the vaccines will be available to our patients at MGH? Um, okay, so for the study on on dog owners. I, I'm, I'm not aware of that study yet. Um, I'd be very interested to sort of read through, um, you know, what their study participants were. I mean, I, I can imagine just so many different um, things we like to call confounders, meaning that things not necessarily related to them owning a dog, but perhaps for them being social in other ways and sort of distant. I, I don't know. So I can't comment on that yet. Um, I do want to clarify something, Mr. Shalito, um, about the someone who has recovered from COVID still transmitting it to others. I that's not. Um, I apologize if, if that's unclear. I'm glad that you asked that. Someone who recovered from COVID and leaves quarantine shouldn't be able to transmit it to others. We think that they're recovered. What I want to clarify is that we don't yet know how long that immunity lasts, and so they could get reinfected and still be. And so that's why. Um, that's mostly what I meant is that. We still don't know when they could get reinfected, and so that's why I would, I wouldn't, I would sort of treat them as any other person and, and distance as I would. Um, and sorry, Susan. So the next question would the be, question was when do we have any estimate of when the vaccines might be available to our patients at Mass General or any of our local hospitals for that matter? That's a great question. I, I wish I wish I could I could say I we don't really um, you know right now. The, I, the federal government has certainly invested money in securing, um, you know, especially with Moderna, um, these vac vaccine supply um, for the United States. Um, but the how that distribution will happen from a centralized approach to then the different states and then the hospitals is still yet to be planned. Um, the CDC does have a document outlining this along with the National Academy of Medicine, but it's really hard to give a timeline. Okay, thank you. Um, a question for Mr. Golden. Um, is there, do you do any of your programs online or is there, and if you do, how would people sign up for them? 
Um, I actually, I do not do any programs online. Um, I used to do in person, and then when um, sort of a COVID hit, a lot of the um, in person teaching opportunities dried up. That said, I work for my local um, YMCA, which is up here in Ipswich, Mass. Um, and I do know that YMCAs, many of them, have um, online programs. Um, there are also other online providers of, um, of programs that are free of charge. And I'm going to pull one up right here that I had used once before, which was, shoot me. Do, 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 um, while you're doing that, we actually have an online exercise program that's available for free that is run through the Dementia Caregivers Program called Ageless Grace. And so if we could maybe put the information up in the chat about how you can sign up for that. Um, it's, 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 I have to say that I have arthritis and I feel 100% better after just doing the things that you just led us through today. So I think this is really helpful. Um, but, we also, but we do have Ageless Grace as well. But go ahead, tell us about the one you were looking for. Sure, and then one, one that I find is very effective and, and it's free of charge. Um, and they really have a, um, a real extensive menu of, um, to um, deal with different populations, but it's called HASFIT, which is H-A-S-I-F-I-T. Um, and I think if you go on, it's very self-explanatory. And again, it will very quickly guide you to uh, an exercise program that's dedicated for your specific circumstance. It's a, it's a young fitness professional and his wife, and I, I really think they do a terrific job. Um, and that, that's sort of centralized if you wanted something more local. I think the local YMCA probably, uh, probably has a variety of programs that are also fit for, um, for different populations as well. Great, great. I want to uh, echo that uh, I've used the HasFit uh, uh, web, uh, web page on YouTube uh, for posture exercises. And even though my posture is terrible today, it did help for a, for a time. So I, I, I highly recommend them. Great. All right. I am just looking through the questions. I think we have addressed most of them. But if anyone has anything else they'd like to hear about, please jump into the chat. Um, but I think that we have pretty much covered everything, although one just came in. Oh, someone's asking if there's a web, okay. Someone found the website for HazFit. Okay. I think uh, Ms. Clark asked a little bit about the patients over 65. I also just wanted to add, so for the distribution plan, I think I mentioned there are priority populations um, that are being um, planned and adults over the age of 65 are, are one of those for phase one. The tricky part is we don't know how many vaccines will be available for phase one and so in what order they will be distributed but we do but from most of the uh, preliminary plans that have been released elderly adults should be a priority population. Okay, I think and then so. one last thing. Just our 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 record this this um, session, like all of our town halls, has been recorded um, and is available on our website. Just go to MGH Geriatrics, and you'll see where it says our recordings, our videos, and we have uh, since April been doing these town halls. So. Um, April is more at this point of a history lesson, uh, maybe not the most up-to-date current, but, uh, but uh, the, the more recent ones are, uh, are I, I, rec I recommend them to you all. So I've got two more questions that I think are actually more than two that are very important. Um, Matt or Sharon, can you say anything, or, or Dr. Sanchez, can you say anything about testing locations in central Boston and there's also a question about at Boston Medical Center, is it okay to go for non-critical visits like audiology visits? So I'm definitely, at least for the testing sites, I'm looking, so the Boston Public Health Commission um, has 
published a list of testing sites for the city. Uh, the mayor Walsh recently called for everyone in, in Boston to get tested, even if not, if, even if asymptomatic. And so I'm going to paste in the chat a list of those mobile testing sites where you can go and get asymptomatic testing. I'm also going to paste this, the state stop the spread campaign um, for people who live outside of Boston. Um, um, thank you so much for that question. Great. I think there are all, I think there are also CDS where you can sign up for uh, for an appointment. Um, I've seen that and patients who have used that as well. As for going for um, any kind of routine testing, um, so here, here's, the, here's the thing. Um, while, while the pandemic is raging, um, we still have healthcare needs and all of our healthcare providers are taking precautions to keep you safe. That's something that you know we can't operate without having a very, very clear infection control pro uh, protocol at this point. Anytime you're concerned about going to a healthcare provider, whether it's audiology, physical therapy, or even to a, a, a laboratory to get routine bloods checked, you can call ahead and ask them, hey, how are you keeping me safe? And I recommend that you do that. But for something like a hearing aid or a vision chat test, um, you know, these are the ways that we engage with our world. And I would never want to delay facilitating optimizing sensory input. I would always want to make sure that your hearing is optimized, your vision is optimized, because this is how we interact with one another. And it's a link to our brain. And it's how we keep not only functionally safe, but cognitively safe. So I hope right. that and answers. I, the I would add to that, um, especially for older adults, getting, getting your dental cleanings is really important. A lot of my uh, patients have not gone, but remember dentists were t taking care of patients way back when HIV came out and they have been in this business for way longer than the rest of us. They have air purifiers, they wear face shields and masks as you know and goggles um, and they have been doing that for many years. So um, uh, many of my patients have gone and had their teeth cleaned and we know that hairdressers um, are also masked, and we know that if people are, you know, masked, um, both parties are masked, there has not been transmission in that way. And so I think that wearing masks is really important and coming in for the things that you need to, to do um, is, is very important for your, for, your, for your sensory input and also for other health issues. So we have another question about exercise, about lap pools. What is... Um, that's is that yeah go ahead <laughs> no that that's a great question um i think what i would say is that mm -hmm. you know over at the beginning of the pandemic we um were more wor we're, we're more worried about the mode of transmission from surfaces um we still know that that might happen but we know that the main transmission is really droplets or small air particles i would say that if you know from a touching or sort of the water the, from the lap pools, it should, you know, I, I would say that they're probably okay, but I would still keep the same measures in mind and thinking about other people around you at the lap pool um, and sort of like how many other people there are. Um, and, you know, I say in general, for example, if you find it might be safer to go in the morning before others have been there, um, that might also help too. But I would think about it more as like, what's going to be your contact with others um, in that pool, in the locker room, bathrooms, that kind of thing. And just always be mindful of washing your hands uh, regardless. I, you know, if I could just add to that, I found that um, at our local Y, you actually have to sign up for a 45 minute um, lap session. So they very much control yeah. the traffic coming in and out. Um, and I find that that's a comfort for people. Yeah, that's great. I, I'm seeing that too in our local, I live in, in Brookline and that's how our local public pools are being managed. Um, there, we have another question about um, what do you think about having cleaners come in if you're not sure about their status? I mean, I think it, I would treat anyone coming into your home the same way, right? I think it all comes down to us being very judicious and mindful of who we're allowing. I mean, anyone that you're allowing into your home and that you're going to be indoors is someone that you need to think about. Um, I guess I would ask the same questions. Um, you know, I, I would, a few things. I would ask the same questions with anyone in your bubble, which is sort of what kind of other work they might be doing, how many other homes they might be going into. Is it just your home or is it others? And what are some of the, and what are they doing in their day-to-day -day life? How many people are they seeing indoors? Are they wearing a mask? All of these basic important questions. And then if they're gonna be coming into your home, 
Um, you know, certainly testing, testing might be a tool that might help you, you know, might, might help you. But again, because of the negative test not being so reliable, I would still encourage them to wear a mask and for you to wear a mask when they're there too, um, if you're going, going to. So we are actually out of time. Um, I just want to let everyone know that these are recorded and they will be posted on many sites, including the Division of, of Geriatric Medicine and Palliative Care at Mass General. They will, it will be on the Mass General YouTube site, and it will also be on the Mass General Stokel Center website. And we got a question about the exercises. Um, we did put a list of the exercises in the chat, and you will also be able to watch them again if you look at the recording. And it usually takes us about a week to get these recordings posted. Um, so, and I want to thank all of you all for coming and everybody who's invited today. Um, we keep you on our invitation list, so we hope to see you again at our next town hall, which will be on December 19th. Um, and on that town hall, we're going to be featuring Dr. Rochelle Walensky, who you've probably seen at some point on CNN or other TV shows, who is our chief of infectious disease at Mass General. So I wish you all a really wonderful Thanksgiving, no matter how you do it this year. Um, we'll be able to share what worked and what didn't on our next call that can help us get ready for the other holidays that are coming up. So please take good care, stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you again in a few weeks. Bye-bye. The next town hall is Thursday, December 17th. 17th, didn't mm -hmm. I? Oh, oh, sorry. Today's the 19th. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Monique. Take care.